Bishop, Bishop is here. The bishop that ordained me and laid my hand that made me an Anglican priest. He is here very life. And uh, he is a, he's an old warrior. And without wasting time, I want to invite my Lord Bishop to take over the microphone. Thank you, please. Can we pick up our programs? I'd like you to I'd like us to turn to page twenty-three, the hymn number nine. Hymn number nine. Hymn number nine, Trust and Obey. The organist and the choir, I hope you are ready for me because I sing very wonderfully. Sorrow we share, we are one. 
to you Lord for truly there is no other way but to truly trust and obey you Lord we ask for help that God by the Holy Spirit you will help each and every one of us to truly learn to trust you and to obey you grant us help Lord to connect into your programs and be able to respond to your instructions. For Lord, you know, truly, it is not of him that wills, nor him that runneth, but of you that showeth mercy. For it is not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. For truly, it is you that works in us, both to will and to do of your divine pleasure. And so, Lord, we rest our faith upon you, believing and trusting very completely that, God, you will help us to hold on to you, that nothing will remove us from your hands. And, Lord, as we have, you have just been blessing us in this meeting since Sunday, you've been speaking and touching our lives, changing our histories, changing our stories, turning around our situations. Lord, we pray that as we further look at your word together, the Father, you will speak to us again. Holy Spirit of God, you know it's only you that can hear from him. Kindly hear from the Father and bring us his will. Speak to us and speak into our lives. And Lord, we pray that God, upon the altar of the Lord that is in this place, we connect ourselves into this altar. And we receive grace, Lord, to function upon the altar of the Lord. And Lord, let there continually be a ladder between the Lamb's altar 
and this altar. And Father, we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you will bring us understanding, revelations, unctions, power, healings, deliverance, so that God, at the end of the day, your name alone shall be glorified. Thank you for hearing us. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Excuse me. Thank you very much. All our fathers who are here and who have been speaking to us in this gathering, I want to thank particularly the vision bearer, our father, Venerable Dr. Chima Ugochuku and his dear wife, Dr. Mrs. Ugochuku, for helping us to come. Because um, the troubles of man. But we thank God that we're here today. And I want to thank all of you who are, who are here and who have been really be receiving from the Lord. And we pray that what God is doing here shall be manifested as soon as now. Amen. Is somebody hearing me? I was, I was in a place on Saturday and um, <laughs> we were praying. It was a conference and we were speaking and praying and suddenly the Lord began to help us to receive some words for them. I was, it was looking, even me when I was speaking, was a bit <laughs> afraid of what I was saying. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, these days they're accusing everybody of false prophets. So, <laughs> so I said, God, I hope that this thing will happen the way you're saying it too. <laughs> because this is the first time that I'm coming to this place. <laughs> you know, so when I finished and I left, Sometimes I get afraid to see people to come out because I don't want to cut them out and nobody will come. <laughs> so <laughs> I just finished and closed my prayer and left. By the time I got to the door, one of them was a woman that the Lord told me there was a cooking pot in her tummy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that God was breaking the, the pots. By the time I was arriving at the door, the woman came and grabbed me and said, My Lord, it is me. <laughs> My it is me. The thing is just disappeared. <laughs> so I left. And then the second one was the bishop. He told me that since he became bishop, no government had talked to him. And that he's just there suffering. So suddenly, um, I think it was the chief of staff of the governor that called, called him and told him that they were coming to worship on Sunday. So this morning as I was coming, I told him, my Lord, what has happened? Because God said he was, this is his time of favor. He was going to visit him. And if you, a good house is, you know, that's the oldest place in, um, in Uwere. Uwere has, that's where the church came first. If you see the place, it's just like my place. I don't know why the first place the gospel comes is always looking very wicked. <laughs> you know, so this afternoon I called him. The man couldn't finish his story. He said, my Lord, the man came. I dragged him to my chancel. And I told him, he said, what do you want? I said, I want my bishop's court to be um, uh, uh, transformed. And then I want the stand office. I want my cathedral to be tarred everywhere. He said, is that all? He said, he said uh, no. He talked another one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, by the end of the day, he's not asking, which one do you want me to say publicly? And which one do you want me to leave privately? He said, talk Bishop Scott and Cathedral. The other one, talk privately. So after the service, I mean, during the service, when they invited the, the man to talk, he said, well, uh, my Lord Bishop, we have discussed, but I'm going to tie your cathedral immediately. Your Bishop Scott, I'm giving you 10 million naira to do all the landscaping. Uh, the women conference, I'll give you for 5 million. <laughs> And then he said, the next day, come, come to my office. So yesterday he went, and he called the accountant and said, transfer the money immediately. So, 
So he said to me, he said to me, your prophecy has come to pass. I said, you never finish yet. <laughs> so people, they look at me, they laugh. When people give prophecy now, I'm going to look at the person with one car eye. You'll be telling me after all, we prophesy that Peter will be with president. And uh, <laughs> they snatch him from him. If not God to speak, why is he not there? Is it patience that is worrying us? Whether they like it or not, is arriving there. It's like the one in a, it's like the one in Enugu. <laughs> like one in Enugu, they are struggling, they are fighting, <laughs> and uh, every day one trouble, every day one trouble. I say it never starts. Now no good case. That one, I don't know whether Enugu people are here. <laughs> I close my mouth here. <laughs> I've got too many enemies because of my mouth and my gifts. <laughs> Leave them. It's coming. But that one is going as well. <laughs> you didn't hear me. <laughs> All right. Now, we, our team is contending for the faith. When I called Una Papa, I was asking him, what is the topic I'm going to preach? He gave me an open check. So I, I don't know what to preach here, but I'm going to say something. And let's just read the epistle. I'm happy that Uncle Raf is coming to be preaching. I know the area he's going to go, so I won't go near there. <laughs> Uncle Raf is there. Very good. So... I will just say a few things as I'm persuaded to say tonight. Is somebody hearing me? Jude chapter 1. Jude 1. Jude is only one chapter of the Bible. The epistle of Jude. Verse 1. Jude is servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And of course, he went on from verse 5, verse 4, to mention certain of those activities. And the summary actually is the sinful operations that men introduced and um, the same is still talking about today. It's still happening. And so, for us to talk a little bit tonight, I would like first of all to, I don't know how we're going to do this fan. I need it, but it's disturbing me. So what do we do? It's blowing my papers, but I'm sweating. So choose one. <laughs> All right, so. Thank you. All right, so we. I'm going to dwell on the word contend and faith. There's an aspect I will like to leave. I want to look at some other aspect of contending for this faith. Of course, the word contend simply means to strive, to struggle, 
or to vie for a contest. And of course, when you talk about contend, to strive, to struggle, of course, it involves a lot of fights, whether it is physical or spiritual. The word contend is, simple, is also like witness. When we, I talk about contend in the context of also the word witness, when we talk about being witness for the Lord, most of the times we leave the word as proclamation of the gospel. Of course, as much as looks at that's the primary purpose or the primary implication of the word witness, but beyond proclaiming the gospel is the second aspect of defending our beliefs. Defending our beliefs Defending what we believe. And of course, once you believe, it brings the word defend, which is also close to the word um, contend, to fight, to struggle, to defend, to find a way to ensure that you stand for the Lord in every circumstance, in every location, in every place. You find out that it takes a lot from us. But before I will go on to talk about contending, there are basic requirements I think that we need to possess. Because if we don't possess it, we may not be able to go too far in contending, in striving, in ensuring that we stand a good testimony for the Lord, both in private and in public life. And each time I want to discuss this, I would like to use a person to do it, to be able to elaborate what I mean. Because for me, he stands always as a model in the scripture. And that person, the first person is Uncle Daniel. I like talking about him. So we will do a little exposition on Daniel as an example of some of the characteristics or some of the requirements that we may need to have in order to be able to contend. Because somebody does not contend for what he doesn't know, what he is not versatile about. One of the biggest problem to contending or witnessing in any matter is ignorance. Ignorance. You know, uh, today we are complaining everything is difficult, including, uh, very, very costly, including education. But some people have said, if you think education is very costly, try ignorance. And um, you can be sure that it is true. Uh, if you go to a family and you notice that one or two of your brothers didn't study as some of you studied, whenever there is a challenge, it's all, that is always a loophole for what the trouble is coming. Because you'll be reasoning up, the person will be reasoning down. And all of that. And it's a lot of issues. So, knowledge is very powerful in trying to contend. When you don't know, you don't even know what to fight. But we like discussing about the man Daniel because of what he represents in what I call the contemporary faith and generation that we are in. I think if we are able to, to get this man and what he did in his days, then we will be able to achieve, if you take up his principles first, like the man was, is a Jewish, he was a Jewish man. And of course, he existed in the days when Israel was terribly involved in idolatry. Of course, if he'd be using, uh, um, using a daily guide, for quite some time we'll be reading First Kings. And uh, uh, I, I think 
One of the things God did to me all through the election was the daily guide that we read in the election times. It was Second Chronicles. And then everything within that period, it was in that context that God taught me about political leadership. And I, was, I have been very bold to say that I am a prophetic politician. Uh, people don't like it, but I don't have an apology for anybody. The reason is that if there are people who should play politics, it is the church. We don't even know what is politics. We think that politics is doing wuru-wuru, eating and looting our economy. That's no politics. We've been able to do some little research on the word politics. And the word politics is a clear Greek meaning. And Latin. It came from the word politico, from the Greek. And from the Latin, it came from the word politica. And each one of them means ability to organize a city. Now, how does that, how does that not, not consign the church? Why would that be the job of an unbeliever? To organize a city, make it to grow? Why should you say the church should be part of it? Because in Africa, we always have a negative definition of everything. For us, politics is cheating and killing and doing juju and all of that, being able to manipulate your brother. That's no politics. My interpretation of the Nigerian politics is wickedness. People are practicing wickedness and they call it politics. It is no politics. It is completely wickedness. And one of the days when we read about Jehoiada and Joash and the role Jehoiada prayed in installing the king over Israel. I know some people will tell me, ah, but that is, uh, 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 that is in Israel. Israel is a Christian nation or a Jewish nation or a religious nation. It doesn't matter. When you read Genesis 1, God gave man mandates to have dominion. And the word dominion means to rule, to organize, to tend, and to manage God's resources. Excuse me. Who has the best qualification to do so? A child of God. And that's why the Bible went on to say, when the righteous is in power, the people will rejoice. Tell me who is qualified to be the righteous. The child of God. Excuse me. Unbelievers have no basis to be in politics, sir. Cure ED. I proved it. And I said to them, I am God's campaign manager. So, if I believe in you, I campaign for you. So if you ask me when I church, who maki head them in a shash, I will do it. So in any case, but look at the trend in the Old Testament. This man called Daniel, like I said, was existed in the days when Israel was in serious apostasy. He was really at the peak. Jeremiah and Ezekiel had been bringing warning from the Lord consigning the state of idolatry and rebellion in Israel. And suddenly, when Israel became terribly obstinate, refused to listen to God, uh, God decided to bring judgment. The thing is about God is that God can be patient, can be long-suffering. You know, God can be so enduring, God can be so compassionate. But please, can we pray and beg God that we don't provoke him to the point where God will want to judge us? Like the way we are already going in Nigeria, sometimes I'm afraid though, it looks like it's judgmental. I don't know whether you agree with me or not. Some of you, you will be quiet now, sorry. Because I'm not prophesying that you should receive your car now. But there is need to consider this matter. So, Daniel existed in that generation. And in the generation in which Israel was taken into captivity. 
Suddenly a man who was of the royal seat became a slave, a servant and a wanderer, a street hawker in another land. Is somebody hear what I'm talking about? The ways of God is mysterious. But like the Bible says, the just shall live by faith. Daniel got into the streets of, of Babylon and um, was hawking and all of that. But what is interesting is that in that, if you like, call it the, the lowest state of a man that Daniel and his siblings and brothers and kinsmen, a kinsmen and countrymen, all of them were in Babylon. The man maintained his faith. He is not like some of us who we want to just get angry. God, after all the fasting and prayer, like our brother just shortly said, he said some of you have prayed and you're already tired. And what you're seeing is not what you're bargaining for. And many of us have already lost hope. In fact, uh, uh, Mama Sarah, yes, the other day was saying in a social network that Nigerians, politicians have studied us. They know that they manipulate us and we have a way of getting along. We don't care. So they have mastered Nigerians. Just allow them to go their way. Even if you like, go and steal all their property. As long as they, they work out for road, they don't care. So that's why they are messing us up anyhow. But the man wasn't worried. He stayed on his faith. No wonder suddenly. You know, one of the things about God, our father, the way I like him is that God is a troublemaker. I'm saying some strange things tonight. Some of you will go and learn some dictionary. You go say, where is this man coming from? God is a troublemaker. And I will prove it for you. When God wants to do a new thing, he causes trouble somewhere to activate his purpose. Is somebody hearing me? And suddenly, with all of the glory of Babylon and their whatever, they were the people who were the captors. They captured the people. They have taken over the resources of Israel. Yet, in the palace, there was scarcity of knowledge. Is somebody hear what I'm talking about? They had no direction to what to do. But when they were their captives on the streets of Babylon. Excuse me. You may think you are a Ghana seller. And you may think that Have I come again? You know I like putting in Sukkah dialect. <laughs> you are saying your own is finished. Ah, my own has ended. But the guy Daniel was on the street. And suddenly there was trouble in the palace. And the king said, look for us, these Jewish boys, who have on wisdom and understanding. Ask me, how did they see a street hawker? And found in him that he has wisdom and understanding. There is a godly nature they manifested on the streets that distinguished them from other people. Is somebody hearing me here? And that located them. You may think that you are one way where you are, they call you. That nobody knows you because you're standing on your faith and refuse to compromise. And probably you have stayed there for a long time. Don't worry. Your story will soon change. Keep standing on what God has brought you to be. Don't change your character. You can see that what Daniel was in Israel. He came to Babylon and he didn't change his nature. He remained. Why others were calling him foolish boy? Suddenly, for his manifestation, 
there was trouble in the camp. They said, look for such people. And they were walking along the streets and they saw some people whose actions were different from others. They said, come, 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 come. And you can imagine a boy who does not have slippers. He may be barefooted walking on the streets of Babylon. And then they brought him into the palace to tell you that this guy is a rugged guy. They brought him into the palace. And you can imagine a boy, I'm not sure he was eating. Maybe he was doing the type we were doing when they were persecuting us in the 70s. Once you became, you became born again as an SCU, your parents, it doesn't matter how they love you, they will throw you away. And then when they throw you away, they say, go, go to those SU people. Then they give you that thing, whether they bring for America. You know, there's something. In fact, my uncle told them, there is one medicine, one medicine, one medicine for America. When they give them to you, you're not going to know your father, you're not going to know your mother. And they say like, uh, senior sister to Chima is talking. It's like they do the thing to her. <laughs> hey! And your ignorant mothers will cry Everybody will be shouting that you have become a waste. And, you know, so this guy, he got there, got into the palace. His condition has changed. His level has changed. You see what I'm talking about? Follow my story. His level changed. His position changed. His privileges changed. I know if Daniel were some of us, you say, Oga, Kai, na, enter palace, na, even with I no see for Israel, I can't see I'm inside palace. Hey, na, make could they eat like Dokubo? Hey. Now, Daniel entered there, they placed everything chicken a la carta, oba, oporo, miriwiri, native soup. All of those rivers find fine food. You know that from there I come from. When you go rivers, you know go return. They cook all of them, place them all over the place. And they say, just chop. As they say, eat and be refreshed. We don't want you to be haggard the way you were. And the Bible says, and Daniel resolved. Excuse me. Excuse me. Daniel did what? Resolved. To do what? Not to defy himself with the king's portion of meat. Hey, each time I read that word, it's how can a poor boy, a street hawker, a stranger, a slave, a poor boy who was formerly living as a royal seed Came into a new nation, he would have said, he would, he, What he would have said, like many of us, Kai, God has lost, restored my lost glory. Do you know what I said? Because now, being a royal seed, he was now brought into the royal palace. So for him, it was what? A restoration. But the man saw differently. Why? There is God in him. Excuse me, I want to ask you. Who is inside you? I don't know. You can shout anything you want to shout. The test of what you have said is when you see what you cannot resist. Is somebody hearing me here? Yeah? And this is where the contention begins. Contending. The man saw but there is someone in him who knows, who in him knows what is godly and what is not godly. And Uncle Daniel said, Oga, Oga Enoch, we will not eat because he has understood the culture of the land that for every food that is given in the palace, it must first be sacrificed to the God of the land. So he refused to defy himself. And he said, give us water and vegetable. Test us for 10 days. Excuse me. For any man to contend for the faith, 
your conviction must be well established. And let me say something to you. I'm going to talk about this just in a few seconds. Your conviction is dependent on your information. Your information is dependent on your source. And that brings us to the fundamentals of our faith. If you are not, if you don't know the Lord, eh, there is no way you can know the Lord. I preach, this is simple salvation I'm preaching now. And I want you to listen to me. Salvation does not come, I preach this almost every year I come. And I don't mind repeating it the way I've been saying it. If you are not born again, and in fact, let me overemphasize it. If you are not thoroughly born again, which is actually should be your foundation. You cannot truly contend for the faith because your conviction is the foundation for your conviction, your godly conviction. And we should know, which I suppose everyone here, I guess, should know, that if you are not born again, you cannot truly contend for the Lord. And when we're talking about conversion, it is not partial conversion. It is not conditional conversion. It is not something that condition made you to repent. So that if the condition changes, you also change. No. It is something where you come to a point. You come to a point where nothing matters to you except the one who saved you. And that is why conversion does not come by learning. It doesn't come by it's not transmitted, it's not transferred to. It is not inherited. Your father is a bishop or is archbishop and for that reason you are a Christian. It's not claimed. You don't claim conversion. It's not like miracle. I claim, I receive. You don't claim it. You properly repent. Yeah, there will be a conviction in your spirit that you are not a child of God and you feel sorry for yourself and the Holy Spirit will convict you and you will thoroughly bend before the Lord and invite Jesus into your life. And let me say this to you. Sometimes it looks very simple. When there are people who are born again or who want to give their life to Jesus, some just come out. I have started telling people that don't come out because they are asking those who want to give their life to Jesus to come. No. Come out because you have realized that you need to give your life to Jesus. The reason is because, like now, we have a lot of redundant human beings who come out every day for every altar call. Every day we make altar call, they come out. They go back, they are the same. It is not coming out that is the matter. It is very, it may be important, but it is not coming out. What is important is the state of your heart. The, convers the conversation in your heart with God at the point of convicting you that there is a sinner. And the reason why this is important, sir, is because it is God alone who sees your heart. No preacher sees anybody's heart. Any preacher inviting you to give your life to Christ is inviting you by faith. Believing that you are coming out also by faith and agreeing that you want to give your life to Jesus. It is when the Holy Spirit sees your heart and sees that you are really repentant of your sins and you are desirous for Christ to come into you, he will come into your heart and change you. And it will be like a film. Very simple, but very genuine. And the reason also is because when you read John 1, 12, which is our fundamental scripture, he say, as many as receive him. And to them that believe in him, he gave power. Do you hear what I said? Who receive him and who believe in him, he now will do what? He will give power. So he's the one who supernaturally gives you power, changes your heart. Now, we, there's a practical example in the scripture and that is the case of Saul. When Saul was 
God caused trouble in his life. Why I say God is a troublemaker? He caused trouble and made their father's uh, she, uh, ass to miss. So, of course, for them, trouble don't come. And the man was busy looking for... He didn't know that God organized it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And that's why when some things happen in your life, watch what God wants to do with it. The first point is not to start grumbling and complaining. Ask God, what do you want to achieve with this situation? So, the father sent him to go and look for us. And the man was going to look for us for the first time. He began to ask, is there any seer here? And then Samuel was, was passing, he was returning to his house. And they tell him, yes, look at him, he's just going to his house. And the man went to see vision for where his ass know, was. We didn't know that God has organized it so that Samuel, because God had told Samuel that somebody is coming whom he was going to annoy the king of Israel. Can you see what is going on? And to make that happen, God caused us to miss. <laughs> Look, how I wish that God would open our eyes to understand the mysteries of his dealings with us. That for any experience we have in life, the first thing we should ask is, God, why this matter? What do you want to achieve with this matter? Is somebody hearing me here? It's not to say, God, oh, I don't know what I did to you. You don't like me at all. Oh. Every day is lamentation. Excuse me. Ask one question. And the man went there. And when he got there, God said to him, The man thou look at, comet. And as soon as he said, so he was entertaining other guests at the parlor downstairs. He said, Climb upstairs. And the man was like, ah, Which kind of presidential treatment is this one? Can you imagine? And then when the guy got there, they had, he told him to come to the high table. Ah, ah, poor boy again. Looking for us. He's now being invited to a high table. Kai, Jesus. And the man climbed there. When he finished, he told others to be going. And, you know, I like what they do. Prophets of old. It's not the kind of noise we are making these days. He saw the prophets. He saw the king. He anointed him without anybody knowing. If not me anoint him now, the next Sunday, oh boy, God don't show me the man who will rule Nigeria. Like the one where me I do too. You know? And that is to through me. God anointed him. Somewhere didn't talk. He anointed him, gave him God's word, and the Bible said, as soon as he turned, the Lord changed what? His heart. In fact, when I read, the first time I read that scripture in the Old Testament, I said, wow. So born again didn't start in the New Testament, sir. And then I began to read everybody that God took in the Old Testament. Each one of them experienced salvation. And that is why for you to be able to contend for that faith you carry, you must be someone who is converted. You must be born again. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? And it is not mechanical born again. It is a supernatural born again. Because that is the foundation of your conviction work. Because you can't even contend for who you don't believe in. Or you can't even contend for your faith. Which faith? Which faith do you have? Like the one we were reading this morning, you know, in um, <laughs> Delhi Guide. And they were talking about Samaria people. They brought the people into the land. Lion came, and then God used that one to trouble them. And, <laughs> and then they came back and now said, uh, okay, uh, please come and tell us the God of the land is sending us uh, lion. And then they agreed. The Bible said they feared the Lord, but they worshipped their God. Me. I, wa I was confused today as I was reading that scripture this morning. Yesterday and this morning. I said, what you can fear in the Lord? And yet, you they worship idol. And God reminded me that that's how the church is today. Is somebody hearing me what I'm talking about? We are fearing the Lord. But we have plenty of idols. 
in our lives. So, you can contend effectively when you are a multi God worshiper. You have so many things you are, you are not committed and the reason is because I can also, I think that your faith is not fully a complete round faith. It is a mixed faith. So, you can't contend for the faith that you have other faiths attached to it. You can't effectively. So, your conversion story, your conversion experience, your life must be well embedded in how you are converted to Christ. Dude, I'm taking time to talk about this though, because if we don't get it right here, there is no contention or no contending you can do. Excuse me. I mean, for instance, now, of course, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm being tempted to go some areas which I don't want to dive into. I mean, when you look at the certain beliefs that we have in our generation, the same church, the same people who read the same Bible, understand Bible differently, interpret it differently, to suit their wickedness and occasion. Oh my God, what kind of people are we? Multi-faith people. That's the kind of church we have now. We are a multi-faith people. And that is the reason why we have what we call dual personality in our faith. In fact, as far as we are concerned, we are only a Christian in the church. In the church. If you come to the church, if you see how all of us behave, you don't see as quiet as we are now. Let these same people attend village meeting. The same us sitting here attend village meeting. Meeting number one. Meeting number one, okay. Eh? You will see what we will do. What will come out of our mouth will not show that we ever went to church. And the reason is because we have what we call wrong concept of our faith. We think that our Christianity is what will take us to heaven. Is the amount of time we spend in the church and the amount of things we do in the church. The amount of sacrifice we give in the church. They are beautiful, sir. But, can I say something to you? The church that we are in, what we do inside here, apart from, number one, the major thing, and I want to say to you, this fellowship and all that fellowships and church meetings you attend, they are what we call manufacturing industry. They are processing plants. It is the church that processes us. It is in the church all of us are processed. We hear the word of God. We are refined in the word of God and all of that. But excuse me, we are not sold inside the church. We are sold in the city. Somebody hearing me here? Yeah? And I want to announce to you that 80% of what will take you to heaven is what you have done outside the church. Go and write it down anywhere. I will prove it any day. 80% of what will take us to heaven is what we do outside the church gatherings. You know why? Uh, let me explain. Number one, apart from this fellowship this week that we're spending like about seven days, sir, after these seven days of spending from morning to evening, morning to evening, the rest of the years is either we come for fellowship for three hours and we go. We go to another church service for another two hours or three hours. During the week, we go for another two hours. How many hours are they? Roughly about seven, eight hours. Am I correct? In a week. In a week. You spend eight hours in a week. How many hours are in a, in a week? 198. 198 hours are in a week. And you spend only 80 hours in the church. And you think that is one eight hours you spend in the church that will take you to heaven. Excuse me. When Jesus was speaking in the New Testament, he said, you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. Are we all together? In other words, you are prepared in the church to lighten the world and to salt the earth. 
you are a finished product in the church. The church makes you into a finished product. As, assuming that we are biscuits. If we are prepared as biscuits, and where will they sell us? In the market. And if they test us and we are not good, what will happen? They will throw it away. So, it is only in the church. In fact, I was preaching in the hotel where I stay. I went there. I've been going there for more than 10 years now. So, it occurred to me, I said, God, what am I doing here? Every day, when I'm, I want to visit Patakot, I sleep in this place. I, I, yes, they do devotion in the morning. But what have I contributed to them? So, the first day, I told the man, I look, I want, every time I come here, I want to have fellowship with you guys once I'm there. So, I had the first meeting. And that day, I don't know why he left me. That was the first place I began to talk about this. And I said to all of them, you spend how many hours in this hotel? Seven to seven. Eight to eight. That's 12 hours in a day. And then you now go to the house. Maybe if you go home by eight, from eight to 12 maximum, you may be awake. You sleep. You eat. I mean, you eat. Attend to your children. You sleep. In the morning again, you get away. In other words, you sleep like about six hours plus 12 hours in the office. That's how many hours? Eh? 18 hours. Remaining how many hours? Six hours. So, six hours you spend like not even every day, but maybe one hour in devotion with your children. And then you go to church. So I said to them, sir, that what you do in this office will determine whether you will go to heaven or not. It is not what you do in the church. Because in the church, you only go to learn. And you present yourself as a holy man. Because if you do something now, Ogachima will, will rebuke you. Everybody wants to show that a nice man. We pretend and cover up. Even say, praise the Lord. When praise the Lord, then they come from our hearts. Is somebody hearing me? So, how will God judge us? By what we do in society. And what we do in society is dependent upon the amount of feeding God has fed us in this church. And that's why I concluded that the church is a, is a, is a, a processing plant where we are processing to finish products and sent out to be eaten but the question, can men eat us? And for us to be eating, the first thing again, sorry I've taken time to talk about salvation in different forms here. The, sh the short and simple of this matter is the fact that everyone who must contend for this faith must be thoroughly converted. Because it is what you have is what you will give. If we are not thoroughly converted, we can't give out things that are of the Lord. You can't defend anything. So that's number one. Number two, Uncle Daniel said there, Oga, we will not eat. Test us in this matter and see what, the, what, what God will do in our lives. Of course, he didn't use the word God, but he said, just watch and see. What will happen? Give us 10 days. And I, I like what happened in verse 9 of that chapter. The Bible says, Now God had brought Daniel into what? Favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And, and that shows you when God brings you to a place of destiny, his presence will be there with you. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? So God gave them that divine favor. They enjoyed the presence of God in that place. Why? Because they decided to honor God. One thing I say to everybody, God is not a debtor. Listen to me. God does not owe anybody. There is nobody who has stood for the Lord. God has ever disappointed. Is somebody hearing me here? God will never disappoint you. Because the man said the truth. He said, just give us this. And they did. And then that sin passed. The next requirement that we need for us to be thoroughly convicted is the fact of the word of God inside of us. 
I'm saying very basic things. These things are not things that are new to you. But I have much conviction that part of the reason why our faith, our Christianity, has not have dwindled so badly is that a good number of us professing believers lack adequate knowledge of who God is because we don't study his word. Look at this basic scripture, sir. When you go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 or 3 verse 15, it says study to show thyself approved. Now, I want you to look at the makeup of that sentence. Study to show thyself what? Now, as far as I'm concerned, when you interpret it in a normal form, I can say it's a study to show yourself competent. Is somebody hearing me here? Yeah? Show yourself competent. And it means that it's only when you study God's word that you can be competent, you can be qualified, you can have the ability to dispense it. So it says, study to show thyself approved. And what followed? A workman that need not to be what? Ashamed. Now, you can see, when you are competent, you can't be ashamed of any assignment. Am I correct? When you see a guy who knows his job, he's bold, he's confident, He's ready to appear anywhere to defend what he's doing. But do you know that many of us cannot answer any question in the office? You can't even explain what you believe. Everybody is doing something. If they are wrong, self, you don't even know whether they are wrong. Because you don't even know what God's word says about that matter. All you will say is that everybody is doing what? Doing it. Sorry. It's not about everybody is doing it. It's about what does God say about this matter. So he said, rightly, and then he went on to say, rightly doing what? Dividing the word of God. Now, excuse me. When he said rightly dividing, it means rightly applying, engaging, bringing into application, using to defend and explain and state your stand. Why you will not do that? Excuse me. You can't do anything without the study of the word of God. And for you, as much as you know before, uh, we used to condemn the Anglican church. For those of you who are there or who were there, you say every time, Anglican church people, they have one prayer. They write it down. They read it. They read it. They just read it and go and sit down. The problem is not in the, in the prayer that was written. The problem is in the people who are reading the prayer. Excuse me, sir. It is not the prayer that was written. The prayer that was written was very powerful. Huh? The one that, the one that some of you are using now to pray in the midnight. Are they not written? Eh. Only Anglican church and I won't kill. Our own correct man. They said and they read prayer. Then they do this. It is not the prayer that it is us. Who will commit fornication? From the bed of fornication, you we want to come and lead prayer. Eh? From the idle house, from nobody house where you are coming from, you want to come and uh, preach the word of God. And then when you come, you drink kai kai. You say the man, no be fire. No, all this thing. Is the man, how can iniquitous man preach the word of God? And today we are repeating the same mistake. We are now reading prayer, written by other men. In the midst of iniquity. And when we finish reading, answer does not come. And that's why many of us are jumping from one church to another. We must study God's word appropriately. Know it. Let it be right inside. Excuse me. Look at what Sam said. I want us to read Psalm 1. It's a very familiar scripture. I don't want to quote it yet. You will see God and the application of his word. Psalm 1. One of the most powerful scriptures on the earth. See. Psalm 1. Are you there? Open it. Let's read it together. Huh? Oh, is there? All right. Look at what he said. Look at one, two, three, go. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way 
of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scumfor. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the riverside that bringeth forth his in season. His leaf also shall not wither. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Excuse me. Did you hear that? Number one is that you must not walk in the counsel of the world. In other words, you must not live in sin. Am I correct? Yeah. Eh. After selling Uruguru in the market, you want to come and sing and prophesy. No. It will not work. God is not a magician. We have tried to make God magician in this generation. But God has refused to be made a magician. His principles are clear. Excuse me. Blessed is the man that walk not in the counsel of what? The ungodly. Nor do what? Standeth in the way of sinners. Nor seated in the seat of the scornful. I'm sure some of you here we are returning officers in the election. And you have to rig the election in your, in your boots. And then you come back here and say, uh, Peter B must win. Did he win in your boots? I mean, I don't understand the church of this generation. I don't know where we are going. And you want to contend for the faith? Nobody is ready to die. And he said, for you, see, for you not to be able to walk in the counsel of the wicked, listen, for you not to, let me quote it the other way around. I want you to get this picture very well. For you not to be able to walk in the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly, no, you will not stand in the world of sinners. No, you will not sit in the seat of discomfort. What will happen? You got to read God's word. You got to meditate upon it. Because David said, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I will not do what? I will not sin against you. Excuse me. It is the word of God in your heart. It's what the Holy Ghost will excavate to be able to give you strength to resist iniquity. Let me say something to you here again. You know, many of us like to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Eh? Many of us need anointing. Many of us want to give the word of prophecy. Once you come, if you stay here, you go see, you go see ten demons here. Cast them away. Excuse me. Have you watched? I want you to watch. At least I used to li I like to use prophecy as an example. If you watch those who give prophecy, for you to know that they study God's word properly, watch their prophecy consistently for about seven, ten times. All you will hear is one type of prophecy. La, 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 la. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. You want us to be afraid that the Lord is here? The Bible has said, when two or three are gathered in, in my name, the, his word. So I don't need your la, 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 the Lord is here. My friend, he's here. Don't frighten us with it. Get the prophecy. And you, the, the amount, let me say something to you. The amount of word of God you have we determine the height you will do, you will go with the gift of the ministry God gave you. The Holy Ghost will not excavate empty space. Whatever it is, it is what is inside of you, which is God's word, that the Holy Ghost will steer up and bring into manifestation. For you to be able to contend for the faith, you must not joke with reading God's word. Personally, studying it, it's not this one that you get daily guide. Uh, the apostle today is uh, Mark uh, 3, um, verse 1 to 10. Then everybody read. This one we read. This one we read. Okay, read for us the commentary. They read the commentary. They say, let us pray. Hey, not be so now. Before you read the commentary, sir, allow each person, at least in your house, to tell us what he learned from his verse. You may be surprised that that little boy that read that verse, the Holy Spirit may give him something that you didn't see. 
It's after you have gotten the individual revelations of the understanding of scripture that you can now say, okay, let us see what the commentary and then you read the commentary to complement what you have said. In that way, you will grow, sir. The reason why the church has been going down is because we believe in stereotypes. Easy. Easy Christianity. Sorry for all of us who are Pentecostals. Because you are not more Pentecostal than you. All you will hear that the Geo said, Father said, that one said, you are not asking what did the word of God say. We are now become robots. Does somebody hear what I'm talking about? We don't have to be robots, sir. Because this word of God is so dynamic that what do not, blessed is the man that do not stand in the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly. You may read it today. The application the Holy Spirit will give you today will be the, different from what he may give you another year coming. Because for every circumstance, the word of God has an implication for a child of God. That is why you need the Rema, not only the Logos. Is somebody hearing me here? You need the Rema, not only the Logos. So when the Bible says, study to show thyself what? Approved, competent, right. Please don't joke with it. You want to contend for the faith? Sorry, sir. You got to study God's word. Other ones you may be given in church is good. They will help you. But spend time. Spend time with God in his word. It is only in that context, sir, that you can surely, not the one, you know, ministers are dying because we have discipled you wrongly. Only a cockroach is flying about. Ah, daddy, daddy, Chima, I'm all I'm here. Oh, cockroach, you're here. Oh, hey, cockroach that you should bind yourself. What is cockroach? That's one, that's one area I like my wife. Oh, my wife. It's a good day, and which is to Ebony Lobachekin cut. ABC Agana Gonaga. She's not even praying. She just believes that in the way he gave me. But one day in my village, we were together. <laughs> so, as she was doing <laughs> late night walk, <laughs> she like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> late night walk, she was typing. So, that day, a man and a cockroach in a fly. Was not ordinary one. It didn't just for a few tab has had. Then straight away, Mark started showing all her hands. He started shouting, Daddy, come on. <laughs> he woke me up in the midnight. I said, What is it? He said, Look, this cockroach don't feel that like this. Look at the mark all over my body. It was not there before. And my eyes they coro coro. So I laughed. I said, well, don't worry. No, say which is no day in our village. Don't worry yourself. So I killed the, the something. I set it ablaze. I spoke, went back to sleep. So in the morning, he said, Kai, I don't know that these wicked people are here. I said, well, maybe. I said, maybe God decided to give you some points so that you don't go. I'm not saying you should worry about them, but be alert in the spirit and ensure that whether they come or they don't come, it doesn't concern you. Instead of, you know, the other extreme will go is to be, have less affair and claim that there is nothing and you are not praying as well. I'm not asking you to allow them to overwhelm you. No, that's not what I'm saying. That one is another terrible extreme. Okay? So we need a balance. And it is only the amount of word of God in you that can really help. And that's why, excuse me, for each one of us, we got to study God's word. I think even if it's only these two, where I talk today, I'm okay. Because I want us to have the foundation with which we can contend. Because the information you have, I mean, I mean, uh, if, I, if I give you testimony of a testimony, uh, let, me, let me tell you one. <laughs> Very recently, two of my clergymen have been worried about me. And they say, Bishop, what is all this thing you're doing? Every day, you're not doing 
You are, you are not doing as if you are retiring soon. I say, which one is your business? We're just doing this one. You're doing this one. You don't want to start your bishop's court. I say, which bishop's court? I mean, um, retirement house. I say, which retirement house? He say, you have to go and look for that. You should stop all these things. Face your retirement house. These people, they don't care for you. <laughs> they came the first time. I told them, don't worry. They came the second time. They came the, the third time I opened my eyes. I said, look, my friend, listen to me. Retirement house. I didn't come here because of retirement house. So. He said, eh? He said, God gave me a burden what to do. And I have not done it. I've asked you people to give me money to do it. You people don't want to support me. I've started to look for money. And I've told God, if you help me to finish this thing you asked me to do, I will be happy. And I turned to them and said, I think I told you people I came from the jungle. I came from where? I came from the jungle. When I retire, I go back to my jungle. That I made up my mind that if God helps me to finish this, even if it's on the last year, I'm retiring. And there's no retirement house. I will go and rent a house in Enugu and live there. Hey, they say, this bishop, I don't know where you came from. I said, I came from the jungle. I know what I want. I know that God who gave me the job, if he finishes it. I said, I have stayed here 17 years. He said, yes. I said, for 17 years I've stayed here. Have you heard that any government gave me money to do anything? They said, no. I said, have we not been doing things? They said, you're doing. After my synod, the man came back. The day I did my, the day I started my synod was the day they started one week sit at home. I didn't even know that I was sit at home. It was on Tuesday, one of the bishops called me and said, Bishop Bezzi, are you still doing your synod? I said, my synod, eh, why not? He said, did you hear that I sit at home? I said, no, I didn't hear. And I said, thank God I didn't hear. Because if I had heard, you probably would have used fear to bombard me. He said, please, though, you better postpone that, you know, that people will not come. I said, my synod, people will not come. You are joking. People don't come finish, and I'm going to do it. So the Wednesday, there was katakata in a new group. Shooting was going on everywhere. People were running. And they were coming and saying, Bishop, Bishop, look at this thing. I said, if you disturb me again, I will send all of you out of this place. And only me will stay there and do my synod. So everybody left me. So we continued like that. I managed to, of course, the day I read my address, it was only three bishops that came. Those who are around. We read our address. When we finished reading our address, uh -uh. Those way they, they perform as their strength reach them. Saturday, we go another place, go continue. Sunday, we close. On Sunday, one government official came. They have never attended my synod. The secretary to government, he said, Governor sent him. I said, But you didn't tell me you are coming. Okay, now sit down. He sat down. He read the address. When he started really talking to us, he started doing politics and talking all kinds of things. And I said to him, Oga. Me, where they here now? I don't tire for now. He said, eh? I say, tell governor, say, Bishop Pace, they don't tire for politicians. My own now, I feel quick. Yes. No, my neighbor, I feel quick. If I see you perform, I believe, say, you dead serious. The man took offense. He went and reported to them. They were hollering everywhere. He said, I no bloody care. So on Sunday, as he left, some people came, gave us, you know, one million, one million, one million. Uh -uh. Before you know it, at the end of the day, I think I got some good money. And so it happened. So, on Tuesday, the clergyman came and said, Bishop, I don't understand the kind of person you are. I said, what is the problem? He said, I have never seen a man who prospers in adversity. Did you hear that? He said, I have never seen a man that prospers in adversity like you. When there is trouble, that is when you... And that is who? God at work. Is someone here talking about, you know, when we repented, that's the time we sing better song. If all things were easy, if all things were simple, where would the cross be? Where would the fight be? But in that hard place, God has given to you a chance of proving what he can do. You know they sing I mean as a, he bought out my bread, he sugar my tea, uh, and I lie. He, he put the bitter cola inside your tea. Yeah. 
<laughs> Those songs are not correct songs. We don't sing it again because and in those days, I, I mean, that was God, God using, giving, giving us impetus to face challenge. But now, you see challenge, you run. Yeah, yeah, you run. You want, you want to be a millionaire. I prophesy to you, you become a millionaire. Yay! Don't worry. Tomorrow I will prophesy to you. I'm not going to. But man, he will sugar your tea, he will butter your bread, but he will give bitter leaf. In fact, na quinine. Quinine. He go put better quinine. <laughs> he go put better quinine. And when you chop him, you go no say God there. Excuse me. That he's the one who delivers from trouble. Is somebody hearing me here tonight? And I want to say to you tonight that your queen, God will turn it into, into a song. Don't be afraid of any queen. For inside the queen, God is there. Is somebody hearing me here? Hey, Uncle Darius came to Daniel in the morning and he said, Daniel, where, where is your God? He said, Papa King. Hey, my God, there you are, he sent the angel. And the lion that came to see, chop me began to sing praises to me. Come on. If he was not thrown in the lion's den, what would have he have said about God's ability to deliver? You want testimony, but you don't want trouble. It doesn't work, sir. It is in trouble that the power of God is made manifest. Therefore, be strong. Stand with him. Contend for your faith. For he shall show himself mighty. Shall we rise up to pray? I want you to thank God for all that he has said tonight. I want you to give him praise. Don't be afraid of that trouble. Don't say God hates you. It is there to make you. It is there to sharpen you. It is there to make you strong. It is there for you to prove who God is. It is not to destroy you. Jesus said, Ah, I allowed Daniel to stay there. For four days he was in that place. I am thank God I was not there. But the Lord wants to prove himself that he is the author of life. If Lazarus did not die, there wouldn't have been any resurrection. Of course, I know it is not funny. It is not easy. It is a very hard encounter. But that's why brother, I mean, God said to Brother Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. I want you to bless God for that experience you have. Thank God for that experience you're going through. Say to that experience, you have not come to destroy me, but you have come for me to prove the power of God in my life. Give God praise. Give him 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 praise. Thank God for that circumstance. God is there to honor you. God is there to make his name mighty. It is not about you. Your challenge is not about you. It is about God. Every situation we are in is not about us. It's about God. May God open our eyes to understand that whatever we are is of him. It is not of us. It is of him. That's why he said it is not of him that willeth, nor him that runneth, but of him that showeth mercy. It is the speakings of the mercies of God. So give God praise. Worship him. Exalt his name in this season. For God will show himself mighty in your case. He will show himself mighty in your case. Bless the name of the Lord in your circumstance. Oh, say to him, God, I give you praise. I give you praise that in this hard place you have given to me, it is a chance of proving what you can do. It is a chance of proving what you can do. And God, I know you will show yourself mighty. 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 In this matter, in this case, 
Lord, I give you praise. I give you glory. Give you glory, Lord. I give you glory, Lord. I give you glory, Lord, for who you are and what you are doing in my life. What you are doing in our lives. Thank you for the express manifestation of your glory. Lord, cause me to be strong in you. Cause me to be strong in you. Lord, open my eyes, oh God, that I may know you. That I may know you and the power of your resurrection. That I may know you and the power of your resurrection. Lord, help me, Lord. Help me in this season, oh God. Cause me, Lord, to be strong. Cause me, Lord, to know you. Cause me, Lord, to know you and the power of your resurrection. Grant me grace, Lord, to weather through the storm. Grant me grace to weather through the storm. Grant me grace to weather through the storm. Grant me grace to weather through the storm. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to pray for one kind of persons today. You know, when I was talking, I was talking about the mixed faiths. Probably you are not too sure you are born again. Probably you are not too sure whether you are truly converted. Or you are afraid of what men will do to you. That's why you are just coming to church. That should not be the reason alone. You must come out of conviction that you are a child of God and you love the presence of God. And if you are here this evening and you don't know the Lord, you have not given your life to Jesus or you are, you are in between in between. You are neither here nor there. But this day, the Lord is saying to you, it is time to give up that sin. It is time to surrender your life. Brother, I'm going to ask you to raise up your hand. I'm going to pray for you. But I want you to know that I here speaking do not see your heart. God himself is the one who sees your heart. And that is why you need to be honest with him. You need to be honest. You're not doing it because of anybody. You're doing it because of yourself and God who created you. So brother, if you know that if you die today, you will not go to heaven. Brother, I would like you to say, Jesus, I don't want to die without you. I want to know you. I want to give my life to you. I want to be your child. I want to be truly converted. I want my heart to be transformed, Lord. Come into my heart and change me. Is there anyone praying that kind of prayer tonight? I would like you to lift up your right hand. Wherever you are, I want to pray with you wherever you are. Is there anybody who wants to give his life to Jesus? This evening? Raise it properly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing so. Please do that honestly from your heart. Because he alone sees your heart. And I can tell you, if that is done from a sincere heart, you will see an amazing experience in your life. You will experience great joy. You will experience great peace. The love of God in your heart will increase. I would like you to put that hand on the right chest. I mean on your chest. That's your right hand on your chest. And say after me, Lord Jesus, thank you this evening. Thank you for making me to discover truly that I have not totally surrendered my life to you. Tonight, Lord, I repent of my double-mindedness, my inability to surrender my life over these years. Lord, I'm very sorry for being a sinner. Please have mercy upon me. I repent of all my sins. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Please come into my heart. Come into my heart. Please change me like you did to Saul, like you did to Paul, like you did to Peter, like you did to others. Lord, please, I want to experience the new birth. Because the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Lord, make me a new creation today. Oh, give me a new heart. Transform me, change me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart, Lord. Make me your son. I surrender totally to you. Every covenant or agreement I made with the devil or was made on my behalf by anybody, my parents or friends, today I renounce them. I reject them. I refuse them. Totally, today I make a fresh covenant with you, Lord, to be my Lord and my Savior. From today, I will follow you. Please, Remove my name from the book of death, Lord, and write my name in the book of life. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing me tonight. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We can clap better than that. Praise the Lord.